thanks to Allah for the moon and the stars. To this event, and I wish all of you can benefit from this event. As you all know, our topic today is related to Islamic environmentalism. And there is many people who doesn't know that the environment has much related to Islam, or vice versa. So if we look into the earth nowadays, it's crying so loud that we cannot ignore it anymore. The traditional climates in various regions of the world is cha changing rapidly because of the fossil energy which is transferring to toxic in spaces causing uh, global warming and exposure to sudden environmental disasters. The earth uh, is, is our home. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides all the things on it for our survival. However, this home has limited resources and our collective natural will be dependent upon the successful management and uses of these resources. We are living in a critical time where global supply of natural resources and ecosystem services is declining primarily and while the demand for those resources is escalating. So from bloating to resource, the oblation to climate change, a growing human footprint is evidence. And this is threatening our future and it's threatening the future of the second generation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in many verses, as well as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the link and relation between the environment and Islam. The Almighty says, he brought you into being from the earth and made you dual in it. So the verse affirmed the continuity of man and earth. The Creator has made us human as Khalifa, successors, in the earth in the sense of preserving all the resources in it. I'll give you an example just to make things clear. If you are an owner, of a company and assign someone to be the general manager for this company. So what is the duty of this manager and what will be his responsibility toward this company? Of course, his responsibilities will be to develop this company by increasing it in its, its growth so man and earth has the same responsibility of a general manager in a company. We must preserve the earth and preserve its resources in order to remain in the best image for the next generation. But we are human can you know treat others differently. You know, if the general manager made any mistakes, probably it would be kicked out. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. We do mistakes with the resources in the earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been taken out, kicking us out from this earth. And He's asking us to repent back for and to repent back to Him and ask Him for forgiveness. Do you know that the World Health Organization, this is from the uh, the studies announced that 90% of the diseases are due to environmental factors as a result of human activities. So everything is affecting the environment is due to the negative consequences happened by us. More than a billion people around the world are struggling to get a clean water. And the statistics indicate that nearly 5,000 children die every day due to water pollution. So who is responsible in this? It's us. Everything, every disaster has been around us and to the environment. It's due to our negative actions. There is no doubt that human beings are the main cause of climate change. 
As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran and he says, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِ النَّاسِ Corruption has occurred in the land and the sea in account of what the hands of man have formed. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and he said, and he prohibited corruption on earth in general, and he said, وَلَا تُسِبُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ بَعْدَ إِسْرَاحِهَا And do not make mischief in the earth after its reformation. Allah the Almighty link between corruption in earth and the destruction of those from an environment and ants and destruction of offsprings from birds and reptiles and living creation. So sometimes, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing clearly the human and what they are doing exactly in this earth. And he says in the Quran, وَإِلَا تَوَلَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُفْسِدَ فِيهَا وَيُحِكَ الْأَرْضَ وَالنَّسِبِ وَاللَّهُ مَنَا يُحِبُّ الْفَسَادِ When he returns back, he means the human, he returns along in the land that he may cause, mischief in it, and destroy the pill and the stock, and Allah does not love this chief baby. So whatever negative actions we do, we Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like it. He put us in this earth as successors. So we have to concern about all of the resources in this planet. Because any negative actions we do, the negative science comes back to us. There is many people might say, uh, you know, I'll be responsible for everything that Allah created for us in this earth. And what are these that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us? You know, everything comes from this earth for our survival. Allah the Almighty, even forbidding wastefulness in the everything because it is a direct cause of climate change. Allah says in the Quran, Eat and drink of provision of Allah. Everything provided to us is from Allah alone. And do not act promptly in the land making mischief. Even the Prophet mentioned in the hadith, you know, everything you do toward the purpose of concerning of the environment, you get the reward, you get salaqah. Look what the Prophet ﷺ has said in the, in the hadith. You removing a stone or ferns and bones from people's path is a salaqah. So any small action you do to save the environment and to save the society, you get the reward. So always think about it. Whenever you do an action, think about the rewards that you get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has a strong relationship between the environment and Islam. So Islam cannot be uh, skipped without the environment and the concern of the environment. So we have to be very concerned and much aware of the negative consequences happening around us, especially to the environment, to the environment. Therefore, preserving the environment is religiously duty for every individual, as it is a society duty. This is confirmed by the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the importance of the balance of the earth and the principle of the observation. There is a beautiful hadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned and it shows us how good actions can see the whole society and how bad action can destroy the whole society which she means by destroying the environment. Look what the Prophet ﷺ says. The likeness of men who observe the limits preserved by Allah and that of the man who Conscience that it is like the people who get on board a ship after casting lots. Some of them are in its lower dock and some of them in its upper dock. Those who are in its lower dock, when they are required water, go to the equivalents of the upper dock. 
and say to them, If we make a hole in the bottom of the ship, we shall not harm you. If, if, the, if they, means the equivalent of the upper deck, leave them to carry on their design, they will be growing. But if they do not let them go ahead with their plan, all of them will remain safe. So there is a ship. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is, you know, giving us the example how we should concern about the environment. You know, if you are inside a ship, there is two levels, one in the first floor and second floor. So those people who are living in the first floor, they have to go to the second floor to get their water. So the water taken is in the second floor. So they said, in, oh, instead of bothering those who are in the second floor, why not make a hole in the ship and we get our own water? So we're going to have to bother them. So if they do so, what will happen to them? Not only them. Those who are in the first floor and those who are in the second floor will be growing, will all get you know, affected. And this is the reality. If we just ignore what others are doing, then the whole world will be affected. You can see you know, what's happening around us. You know, hurricanes, uh, Corona and China now, everything is happening due to our negative actions. So this is a sign that we have to revert back to Allah and ask Him for forgiveness. Therefore, referring to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet is the aid the solution to avoid corruption and environmental problems such as disasters, hurricane, earthquake, and floods. As for treatment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has linked environmental corruption to supplication. So how can that be linked? Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. وَلَا تُسِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ بَعْدِ إِسْلَاحَهَا وَدْعُوهُ قَمَعَا إِنَّ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ قَرِبْ مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Do not make mischief in the earth after its reformation and call him fearing and hoping surely the mercy of Allah is near to those who do good. So whenever you do bad actions, you repent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him for forgiveness. And always concern about doing good actions. It's either to the environment or either to the humanities and societies. In addition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned how he facilitated everything in the earth for our survival. And he says in the Quran, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّلَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضَ جَمِيعًا مِّنْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ He has made subservient to you whatsoever is in the heaven and whatsoever is in the earth. It's all from Allah. Most surely they are signed in this for a people who reflect. In addition, Allah says in another verse, هو الذي خلق لكم ما في الأرض. It is who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created for you all that is in the earth. So there is so many things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created for us. You know, the waters is created for us. The air is created for us. Everything, the technology now we have is 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 provision from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we have to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we cannot thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all, for all provision that He provided to us. Look what Allah has mentioned in the Quran and He says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تَحْسُوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ And if you would count Allah's favors, you will not be able to number them. Most surely Allah is forgiving and merciful. If Allah is treating us with His fairness, then all of us will be destroyed. All of us will be losers. Allah is treating us with His merciful. And Allah does, did not create us to punish us. Allah created us to see how much are we going to follow from His commands. And part of His commands is to be concerned of the environment. If we look to what the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned that how we have to be concerned about the resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us. In the hadith it says by the Prophet Muhammad, he passed by Sa'id, it's one of the companion, 
when he was performing abortion. You know, think about this. And I wish from now on, when you do an abortion or when you take a shower, you concern about the waste. And he said, the Prophet said, what is this wastefulness? You know, if, if someone is making an abortion, he's preparing himself to make the prayer. You know, if he's making an abortion and I, I, I pass by him and I see him, you know, the water is great, and I told him, you know, this is waste, he would be shocked. You know, what are you talking about? What, what waste is this? I'm just doing my abortion. And this is what Kadu said. He was shocked as well. And he said, can there be any wastefulness in abortion? The Prophet sallallahu responded to him and he said, yes, even if you are in the bank of a fluid rubber. See, a fluid rubber you are mixed with, how much water you will use? Very little. But the Prophet is, 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 you know, encouraging us to be concerned about this water because Allah might take it out from us. So concerning about this, you know, provision that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for us, it's part of concerning of the environment. In another hadith, the Prophet says, No Muslim lends a man or sows a crop, then a person or work of an animal is from it, except that it will be in charity for him. So if you plant a plant and who are eat from it, you get sadaqah. And this is what now sustainability goals is, is all about, you know, lighting the earth and making everything green and all. It. This is already mentioned in, in, you know, in the Islamic history and it's mentioned in the Quran. The Prophet also mentioned 1,400 years ago. I just want to conclude because others need to talk. Concerning about the environment is important, specifically with regards to human life. And his future and earth. This component is determined by our practical result in many aspects, including the achievement of comprehensive development such as economic and social corruption through the, uh, the development and conserving of resources, meeting human needs by increasing production and controlling consumption, thus providing the well-being and happiness of people, achieving security and stability for the people on earth through cooperation and common interests such as food security. I hope this lecture about the environment allows us to reduce the negative impact of our action and at the same time increase our ways of communicating the values and principles to the environment of society as we strive our best to protect our planet and thank you very much for listening. I'm going to start with one thing. When you think of environment, where does it begin from? And how do you define environment? Does environment begin from here onwards? And if it begins from here onwards, are you part of the environment or not? How do you see yourself with the environment? Um, I don't know what definition of environment you have. And it's something that we need to have. Uh, how we define environment. And I'm not going to define it for you now myself what's the academic definition of environment. But uh, I'm gonna go quickly through three things that I have been thinking about the concept of knowledge, because environmentalism and Islam and the whole field is a field of knowledge. And uh, I have come to think, and I think you might agree with me, that there are three types of knowledge. There's a knowledge that is revealed, that is prophetic knowledge, that is religion, and there's a philosophical knowledge that is based in analogical deduction, argumentation, and then there's scientific knowledge that you can repeat it again and again and again. There are three different distinct types of knowledge that exist. And most often, after the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment period and all that in the West, that dichotomy of religion and science and other, uh, and, and, and philosophy, that somehow, the uh, revelation and religion has been put aside and people think that, oh, when we talk about environment, we have to talk to a scientist who will tell us how to solve the world's problems. We don't need to go to the Bible 
we don't need to go to uh, other religions, or we don't need to go to Islam, for example. So I'm going to um, in line with those thoughts, I'm going to go through how I see, as a Muslim, Islam has an environmental theory. For me, theory is very important. Um, because all society functions on the basis of three things. Theory, system, practice. For everything, you have a theory. Then you have a system, you have a practice. If the practice doesn't work, you have to recheck check your system. If the system doesn't work, you have to look at the theory. You have to adjust theory, you have to adjust system, you have to adjust practice continuously. With all that, that dichotomy between those three things, the society can move forward. So what is the Islamic theory of uh, environmentalism? Where do, where, where do we get when we say we should, we should not? Where do we get that? Where is the philosophical, if I use that word, where is the philosophical base of some of the policies we drive from the Quran, from Islam? How do we do that? So this is my thought experiment through which we have to uh, Islam. The interesting thing about Islam is that Quran and the relation with other uh, uh, okay. I told you I did care to bear with you. What, what I found interesting about Islam is that Islam sees itself as a continuation of other religions. It does not say that Christianity has nothing to do with me. Even paganism, with pagan ideas, there are verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you ask the people of Makkah, the mushrikeen, the pagans, who is your God? They say Allah. Allah is our God. How is that possible that people who are pagan, they still believe in a God? And if you look at all pagan beliefs, you will realize that even in pagan beliefs, there are the DNA of a religion. For Islam says, that it, God has sent many prophets to many nations, and over time, those messages went corrupt. But the DNA of some of the goodness within those state, within those ideologies and of those beliefs. Why I bring paganism here is because I studied in Australia and looked at the theory of environmentalism. And one thing that allows scientists to develop and help industrial revolution move forward, and especially in the field of science, was the idea that animals don't have a soul. Since animals don't have soul, they could have done anything to animals. There was lots of experiment in the West on animals, and the church did not stop them, because animals didn't have a soul. But the pagans believed that animals have souls. The pagans believed that the rocks and the trees have souls, and that's how they explained it. They said, no, they were so anti-Christian. And now if you look at modern movements in UK and parts of Europe, pagans are coming back and saying, this is our area. We are fighting for environment because religion is distracted to environment. But having said that, let's look at, uh, I want to read a few things I've written here. So one of the claims of Islam, which is, I believe in, uh, it's my religion, I believe in that. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, Surah, Juma verse 5, the similitude of those who were charged with the religion, with, with the law of Musa alayhi salam, but who subsequently failed in those obligations, is that of donkey, which carries huge uh, tombs, a lot of books on them. Evil is the similitude of those people who falsely uh, assign to Allah things that Allah did not say, and Allah does not guide people who do wrong. This is in Surah uh, al juma verse 5. I'm not reading you Arabic, I'm reading you what is in English in a conversational way, not exact, the old Arab it, translation of English in a very Shakespearean translation, most of the Quranic translations are. So here, from that, if I were to draw a theory from that, would be that, look, this verse is talking about having books, libraries, doesn't mean much. You could be carrying them in your societies, in your libraries. You could have them in your iPhones and all that. But what do you get from it? Do you practice it? Do you follow it? Those people who were given the law, they did not follow. And as a result, Allah changed the law and brought new laws for them. So here, Islam claims that Christianity, or the law of Moses, belongs to Allah. Allah sent those laws, but people forgot it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Nuh, and certainly we raised in every nation a messenger saying, 
serve Allah and shun shaitan. This is the very interesting, shun shaitan. So there were some of them whom Allah guided and they were who, who guided and there were others against whom error was due. Therefore travel in the land and see what was the end of the rejecters, those people who rejected. So the story of the flood of Nuh, the, the, the flood in the town of Noah, is for me is a very interesting one. Because here, in other verses, the Quran talks about how Allah brought life from water. And here, water takes life away from everything on earth. And what does that mean? For me, from a theoretical perspective, I look at it that if I can draw from that the theory to say anything in excess can, be, can cause distraction. But there has to be due, there has to be a measure for everything. And that's why um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, and, and you have to uh, uh, worship Allah as Allah uh, uh, is due to be worshipped. You, you have to be just to, 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 to God, otherwise, you are falling out of that measure that God created. And the other verses of the Quran says that Allah created everything in due measure, in, in, in a mizan, it's, it's in, in a balance. So what is the environmental distraction? It's a distraction of that balance. The moment we destroy that balance, we have destroyed what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And there are other verses, if I get time to go through it, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says how um, people have tried to change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, uh, the, the, the creation. So the view of Islam is that what good remains in other belief systems are from Islam. God has sent his messenger to all nations and over much of those, uh, and over time much of those messages were lost and the DNA of goodness remains in all of the religions. So I want to go back to, the, to that concept of uh, read a few lines, structured lines from what I have written on the issue of Musa, uh, Nuh Islam. So in the story of Nuh, the oceans rose and drowned the earth, or much of it, depending on the version of the interpretation that you like to accept. But one thing remains constant. No matter what interpretation you take, the oceans rose and distraction fell upon earth. All agree on that, that the oceans rose and the earth was destroyed. The Quran says that water was sent to earth, it did not originate on earth. Allah says that he has sent water down to earth. It is a resource sent by God. So it also, if, we, if I were to look at it in terms of a theory, I can see that this is not an earthly origin, it is a heavenly origin. The origin of water is heavenly, so therefore it is a limited resource. It is not from the earth, it was brought to earth. Um, Sorry, my computer keeps on jamming. So in the Quran, in Surah Al-Furqan, in verse 2, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have created all things in due measure. In other words, everything is delicately balanced. Everything has a measure that must not be disturbed or else mischief will fall upon earth and that which exists within it. Within it, and that's one of the verses that was uh, 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 read before that uh, do not create mischief on earth. The story of the creation of humans on earth in the Quran is radically different to that of the Bible. You might say, What is he talking about? He's talking about the environment, now he's talking about the story of creation. But before the creation of man, God says to angels, I am going to create man on earth, he's going to be my Khalifa, my Khalif, vice chair, to my representative. Representative in the sense that, 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 that man will be godlike, in God's image, loving, caring, responsible, and law abiding. But I put that deliberately there because I want to drive a point. Man is to be in the image of God and law abiding, but is God law abiding? There is a hadith Qudsi that I have read where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he has forbid for himself to be unjust. So God has a law by which God does not break that law. I mean, he stays by that law and expects us to stay by the law of God. 
So we're talking about a God that created the world in, in due measure and wants everything to be just. And one of the measures of justice is to keep the balance, the balance of earth. When I did my environmental studies, the main topic that we talked about was sustainability. And do you know how sustainability is, is, is defined? Um, I'll come to that point. It's a very interesting one of how sustainability is defined in modern day. So let's go back to the story of, of creation. So the angels say to God, are you going to make a being on earth who will cause mischief on earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I know something that you do not know. Then God brings Adam forth to tell the angels the names of things and show to the angels that, the create, that, that, that this creature, this Adam, this man, is an intellectual being. He has the power of speech, and his speech is the power of thinking. And in the linguistic theory, there is no language and there is no thought. They're both together. You cannot think outside of language, you cannot language outside of thought. It's a very deep, interesting linguistic theory that you have to look into. And, 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 and that's uh, something that we can drive from uh, a lot of theories. Why I brought that issue here is that I want to emphasize on the concept of intellect. <coughs> and intellect and environment. In so many verses of the Quran, Allah says to, do you not think? Afala ta'qilun? Afala yatafakkarun? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran brings amazing story. And towards the end, it says, afala ta'qilun? It's almost like I tell you something, and towards the end I say, didn't you know that? You knew that. It means I didn't have to say that. It's in you. You knew it. So when Allah says, aflat aqilun, means if you only thought, if you only used your intellect, you would have reached the same conclusions. That why the earth is created, why the moon is created, why the sun is created. So pondering and thinking is what Islam is inviting us to. And why I raised in the very beginning and said, what is Islamic, what is environmental theory? Where do we drive the Islamic theory of environment? Pagans go back to their pagan beliefs and they bring them. And scientists go into scientific data and they bring it from there and say, look, I've got scientific data, so therefore the earth is warm. Where do Muslims come and say, here's my environmental theory? It's good to recite verses, but you need a sound environmental theory that has all the argumentation, and that has to be developed. And why I'm raising this here? Because I believe there's a lot of students here. And this is the job that you have to do. You have to do the tafakkar, you have to do the thinking. You have to develop that. And that's what we need to do these times. And why these things did not develop over time in Islam is because we didn't, didn't develop such institutions of, of environmental uh, protection agency or this and that. It's because of the nature of our governments and the politics in our region. So the Quran says the heavens and the earth and all that there is in it glorify him, glorify Allah. And there is not a thing but glorifies his praise. But you understand not their glorification. Truly he is ever for, forbearing, oft forgiving. Al Isra 44. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the skies and the earth, everything in it, the rock, the wood, the table, that table has been cut, it's a wood, it's dead, but glorifies Allah. It has a right to be there, you cannot abuse it, you cannot destroy it. So everything, the chairs, the table, the things that we make, everything glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we do not view it. Doesn't that sound like what I said in the early part of my talk, that the pagans believe that everything some said everything has God in it, and some said everything has, uh, has a spirit in it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says everything has glorifies God. So it's interesting, early Muslim scientists did not go on a rampage and destroy so many animals to come up to medical conclusions. But in Europe it did happen, because they believed that animals don't have souls, so they could do anything to animals. And it's well documented. But in the Muslim world, early scientists were very cautious of how they're going to deal with animals. We don't have pictures of animals being cut up and, and, and basically destroyed to see how the heart works and how the lung works. Um, so pagan belief 
uh, says in modern days when you look at the literature in the book, uh, they say draw energy from the earth. So that's, that's where they came. We say draw your faith from Allah. And the scientists say draw your knowledge from scientific research. And then they talk about love, <coughs> truth, and justice. Here we all converge. Scientists, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, all we talk about love, we talk about truth and justice. But we have to have the philosophical foundation of where we get this from, from our texts, from our books. Um, there is a, a hadith I came across uh, that says, uh, Prophet Muhammad said that on the day of judgment, a sparrow Will, will, will rise and tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that so and so killed me with no need. And, and, and that unjust killing will be avenged by Allah in the form of punishment to that man, for that man. So why do we say in the name of Allah when we slaughter an animal? What is the theory behind that? When we kill an animal, we say Bismillah or Allahu Akbar. It's an, it's, we, we, we do that consciously to say, I have no right over you except the right that God gave me within certain limits. I can't just go and hunting because I like hunting and, sh and leave behind 300 animals dead and say I have a good time. That's against the principle of Islam. And, we, uh, and, and you can see how much uh, hunting has caused destruction to wildlife. These things can be drawn, these theories, from Islamic values. And remember the word no need, when this Pharaoh said, he killed me with no need on the Day of Judgment. What is need? The UN defines in a sustainability development document. It says it's development that, needs, that, that meets the needs of the future, of a current generation. I stop again. It says sustainability is meeting the needs of the current generation while keeping the needs of the future generations in mind. There's a lot of literature, literature written about the, uh, how do you define need and how do you define the need of the future generation. What does the Quran say? Eat and drink, <coughs> do not waste. And it says God does not like those who are wasteful. So, I have a rule in my house. I say to my wife, when you have rice, when it's finished, at least leave it for two or three days, go without rice before you buy new rice. Don't top up continuously on everything. Let the house be free from these things and then bring new. It's almost like detoxing yourselves. You know, you had meat two days, don't have on the third day meat. Have something else. Believe me, when I say environmentalism in Australia, they keep on talking about amazing theories, but nothing changes the culture. Television constantly telling you buy, 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 buy. The entire culture of consumerism is there. And yet, they will talk about these big philosophies of saving the planet. How are you going to save the planet if you don't change your personal habits? And you don't have that moral conviction that you're not going to change your personal habits. Where does that come from? come from scientific research, there are a lot of scientists who go uh, hunting. So I'll just quickly go, I'm almost finished, sorry I've taken too much of your time I think. Imam Ahmad and Imam and, and Abu Dawood have narrated that the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has said, people are the stakeholders in three things. In food, it basically it says in in. Um, let me just uh, I apologize. Uh, okay, I'll just say food. Basically, it's grazing, vegetation, uh, what what you eat in food, in water and in fire. So this can become and can be taught as a principle of Islam in environmentalism. The certain things everywhere has a stake on fire. Everywhere has a stake on. So, 
there has to be a, a, a proper forest management so we don't have fires like Australia. Because those fires, we all have a stake on it. It affects everybody. Like the example that was given before when the ship is cut, the bottom part of the ship is made a hole in, the whole ship goes down. You can't say it's Australian Germans, I don't care about it, it's my continent, don't worry about it. We are all sitting in the same ship floating. So we have a stake in management of fire, whether we use it, and fire could be also defined as fuel, in water, and in food. Also, as I said, the word Allah says, uh, do not follow the path of shaitan. Wasting is evil. And those who waste are the brothers of Satan. And God says, don't be like Satan. This is in Surah al Isra. I can get you the actual verse, but I forgot to put the actual verse in Surah al Isra. That's the verse. Do not, you know, those who are wasteful are the brothers of Satan. And in Surah al rum 41, Allah uh, verse 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Corruption has appeared throughout the land and sea by reason, by the reason of what the hands of people have earned, so he may let them taste part of the consequences of their actions, what they have done, that perhaps they will return to Allah. Even the punishment of Allah is a blessing from Allah to bring us back to the foundation, back to that tawheed, to that, that there is a God and that God wants us to be caring, loving and responsible and law abiding. In Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 119, Allah says, and they change God's creation. You can see how part of the scientific community has gone astray in its <coughs> providing food by creating genetically modified food. And that has actually caused a havoc. If there is actually, if you look at the, what's happening to indigenous seeds and flowers, and what's happening to bee colonies and all the insects around the world, how they are collapsing because the pollen and everything is contaminated or certain crops do not produce enough pollen to don't produce the right pollen for the insect life to survive. And yet the United Nations says we are very good people and we are sending you lots of billions and hundreds of tons of food. But at what cost? At the cost of changing what God has created. They're changing the creation. And Allah says do not do that. And we have done that in the name of science. And so we have, we have disturbed the eco-balance, uh, the, the balance of the ecosystem. It is narrated that the Prophet Muhammad has said, if the day of judgment begins, if the sa'a comes, if the hour comes, and you have a tree in your hand, plant it. Tell me which philosopher said that? Where did that come from in any of the literature you read about in moral intellectualism? I'm all this time, I apologize. So, so there are many prophet, prophetic tradition cursing those who urinate in still water. And still water can be defined as lakes that are inland lakes, the protection, that concept that someone should not throw foul things in still water. If we were in a university classroom, we could quickly ask, what is still water? How much is still water? What about in lake? Is it in lake? Can we put the city's sewage into an in lake? There's a lake that's inside the land, not open, open seas. From that, an environmental policy can be developed. It's forbidden, don't do that. Do not uh, uh, damage uh, this water. <coughs> and finally, I say this, that if you look at all the explanations when Allah talks about heaven, does not describe a concrete jungle. It's always about Jannah. So it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes about Jannah, about paradise. It is not a concrete jungle. It does not talk about high-rise buildings with lots of steel and metal and things like that. It talks about gardens, places with flowing water, with good air. And 
inviting us towards that. And part of our job on earth is to do Imar. Imar is to build the earth. And we have a model in Jannah. If you, if you bring Jannah in our mind and think about it, we can develop our cities, our carbon cities. So finally, I say this, and Allah says in the Quran, do not corrupt the earth. Do not kill yourself by your own hands, which we seem to be doing with global warming, water the rising, uh, uh, so much is happening, the air is being polluted. If any of you change or reject the blessings of Allah after it was sent to you, or you came to know of it, then know that Allah is swift in repercussion. Shadidul Iqab. We will get it on this earth. You will get that. You see the environmental degradation that we have. Where did it come from? We are disturbing that balance. And all that theory can be driven from Quran. And thank you so much. And I hope that that was a bit useful for you. I think I want to say something about the name Islamic environmentalism because I thought it's peculiar. It's nice, um, but it's also um, maybe a snore. The environment isn't something that anyone monopolizes. So there isn't any sign of environmentalism as such, in that the environment is already signed, the environment is already Muslim, not capital M, small M. The environment has already submitted its will to the divine will. The way, the pattern, what and how it's supposed to function is only following that. You know who's not following the divine will? Us. Who said that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll give you the other two later, okay? Exactly. The one creature that was given free will, instead of using it for good, we do, but we most um, often use it for other purposes. So if anyone would be questioned, it will not be the high seas, it wouldn't be the burning bush, um, or, or, or the brush fires, it wouldn't be um, even the heavy rains that are causing floods. None of those things will be questioned what they're doing. They are following the pattern that they're you know, meant to follow. But we are the ones that are building in low lying areas, we are the ones putting architecture where it's not supposed to be. If you build a house, in a place where it's supposed to rain a lot and your house is green on the floor instead of raising it on sills, then when water comes into your house, who do you blame? When you build your house in a place where it snows a lot and you decide to build a roof that is more like open arms and then that roof collapses because it's still like so much snow, who are you to blame? So there is no bad rain, good snow, bad snow. The weather is perfect as it is. There's bad architecture and there's bad planning from our side. As humans. So we are all at fault. And some environmentalism, uh, like I said, I thought it was a Muslim word because the environment is already Muslim. Um, the sun rises from the, um, from the east and sets in the west, it's all on its back. Plants grow, twists turn, and you also see to just get to life. They are all on their back. Every feature is set for us to be sons and daughters of Adam. Because we have people that were blessed with us. So if there's something to question, it is us. We need to take a step back a little bit and, and, and focus on what happens even before we talk about sustainability. I mean, I love that you brought the definition. There's a lot more in the literature about this definition of sustainability. But if you look at it again, there's a question. Is it sustainability, ability, or sustainability? If, if you say it fast enough, it sounds the same. Sustainability, sustainability. I mean, we are not. I think we're missing the point that we're talking about sustaining something. Sustaining something means keeping all the status quo. So if we're talking about medicine, and someone fell in front of us right now, we need to give them a CPR. They don't fall in front of us and say, well, we just need to sustain. We need to stabilize that state that they're in. I don't think that that's what's going to help this person. We need to do the resuscitation, the reviving. Right? The help of the thing, once they're back up and they're better, then you resuscitate. Then you say now that they're stable, now that they're all better, where they're conscious, you can sustain um, that state. So when we look at the world right now, I don't really think we should be talking about sustainability because that's kind of saying let's just keep it as it is, as So we need to resuscitate and revive the environment. 
Most of us know the simple John Gandhi's words that you have to be the change that you want to see in the world. But you know what this one great lady said is that everyone talks about this and everyone wants to change the world. But guess what? No one is ready to change themselves. So again, we go back to the problem. So the Japanese have this term, uh, they have this very um, huge love for the nature. A lot of people know that. Uh, some say it's the culture, it's just the beauty that the country has as an island. Um, it's Zen, right? They have this concept called forest bathing. I don't know if you've heard about it, but basically they believe that you go into the forest and in the forest all your five senses are, are fully awake and aware and you get better at that by being just out there in nature. So it's almost like you're just walking the forest, you're bathing in that forest. Okay, it's giving you its, um, its energy. Bhutan, another country. This country is a small, you know, landlocked Himalayan kingdom. It is now known as one of the happiest places on earth. Their values, the majority of us, but their values are so embedded in what they like and what they do that they have, for example, instilled within the Constitution things like the law that says for all eternity, the land of Bhutan should at least be 60% covered by trees. And that killing an animal that is protected from being endangered is like crime against the state. Values like that. But again, like someone said earlier, maybe we miss some of those values, Islamic values, Islamic perspective on what to do with the environment uh, because of not having those policies being put into place by decision makers. When we talk about environmentalism from an Islamic perspective, we're actually talking about a moral commitment deeply rooted in the purpose of our own creation. Because in Islam, the Islamic faith tradition, even before the action, what is important is the intention. In the and if our intentions are in line with the divine will of what and how and our purpose what we're actually created for, then the, the balance is maintained. Let me that. So when we talk about the concept of Khilafah, that vicegerency that we were made to be successors here on this earth, but there is another concept of Brahman, trust. Because of that free will that we were given, no other creature has been given that trust of taking care of this environment, taking care of this planet and its resources, taking care of human life, because the most human beings, sons of Adam and daughters of Adam, are dignified with it, without the government of the Adam. I mean, so all that is important. And what we're doing by not taking care of the environment is actually diminishing that value of life. The environment doesn't discriminate us, as I was saying earlier, and it doesn't need to be monopolized or doesn't need to be monopolized. It helps everyone, and it hurts everyone equally. Likewise, everyone also can hurt the environment, or everyone can help the environment equally. No one is required. So I don't believe that we should be living too much in, um, and I'm sorry to kind of maybe just disagree a little bit on this, on the theory part of things, because I think Theory again is attached so closely to the way education is built today that we can have all types of degrees. But just because we have a degree, for example, in the environment, does not necessarily mean we have a connection with the environment. Because you're in an office or in a library when you're seeking a degree. You're not out there in nature. You're not out there in the, in the river. You're not out there actually connecting with this earth that you're claiming or saying that you want to protect. And therefore, there's a disconnect between reality what's on the ground and, you know, what is maybe being written or on paper. And I say this because I've taken just a couple of examples. Yesterday, there was a Chinese girl, um, a student in Australia, who survived five days in the forest. They went 19 and she got separated from the team. Five days in the forest. This person will never live in the forest the same way again. She survived. She didn't have that bad food or anything. Actually, when they found her, like they were stressed for her after five days, they gave her some sauce because they didn't have shoes. She had lost all of those things. It's not a pretty place. It's not a safe. It's, I'm not going to say it's not a safe place, but it's not a place that we have been trained to live in because we live in concrete jungles. We are so disconnected from the internet. The moment that lights go off right now and the generators go front, we're all men and women thinking, no matter how big and strong that we are as adults, we're probably going to be panicking, scared, and not know what to do. 
So what is the purpose of what we're doing there? When we don't have a connection with this earth that is actually nurturing you, this earth that you were created and this earth that you will go back to. So I want, and, and, and uh, this girl, she, she survived basically by drinking water from some trees. How many of us putting water? Because if it was not, and people have poured something in there, she would have died in day one, the first sip she took from. And by sleeping in some caves. This person's respect for nature will now be ingrained in her life for the rest of her life. It means that we can survive. We really can survive three weeks without um, food, um, three days I think without water. And uh, there's another one about, there's another three, so we'll freeze. But sleep is a thing that will kill you if you're not getting it. But you can have to go three weeks without food. Because, I mean, we got a long story in our body today, I guess, of you know, everything you need and the pizza in your body. You probably have a lot of stored fat in your body that you can, you know, keep going for about three days, about uh, three weeks. Okay. So, the Quran tells us um, a lot of verses were read. Um, Father the Quran, I just want to give advice to his son and talk to his son. He says, do not walk cautiously around and do not turn your cheek in contempt for people and do not walk through the earth exultantly. Indeed, Allah does not like everyone's self who is and boastful. Unfortunately, that's yes, again our state today is that we, because we lack this connection with nature and we believe that we have degrees and living fancy, you know, uh, you know army buildings and cars and all these things and homes to appeal them, that we are self sufficient. And therefore, that has come somehow brought in some arrogance in us. And like I said, the moment that you lose all of that, and you're actually out there in the wild where phone doesn't work, none of those things work, then you start to realize that you actually don't have that real knowledge, real knowledge of survival, real knowledge of nature. What can I eat? What can I not eat? I did a three day, two night stay in the jungles in, in Malaysia, just an hour as I was before. In those three days, I learned so much more than I learned in academia or you know up to my master's level. Because your body is in the, the the moment you are with the elements. You need to know when you get cold in the jungle, I never knew we'd get cold in the jungle. I know it's humid in Malaysia, but I never knew we'd get cold in the jungle. But it's its own microclimate, and you wouldn't know that until you're in there. But we were drinking and getting our water from a little ravine and boiling it and, and eating. And you know, you lose weight, but you have so much respect for nature because you realize that even at night, I never thought it was going to be so loud at night in, in, in the jungle. It was as loud as New York City, uh, City, for example. There are animals that don't live in the daytime, they, they sleep in the daytime. So at night, that's when they do their thing. And it was loud. And the first night, it was, it was difficult to sleep at night, of course. But the second night, you're used to it. And then you're like, okay, I'll sleep because you need to sleep. Moderation is another thing that we lost today. So Prophet Muhammad is used to give the advice of his son and says, and be moderate in your face and lower your voice and be the most disagreeable sounds is the voice of donkeys. They're basically people who prance around just boasting. And then the verse continues, do you not see that Allah is being subject to whatever is in heaven and whatever is in the earth and have to bestowed upon you his favors? Apparent and unapparent. But of the people receive the students of Allah without the knowledge of guidance or an enlightened people. So, why isn't there a Muslim greater than Uber yet? I didn't say why isn't there at all. Why isn't there a Muslim greater than Uber yet? Look at where she grew up in Scandinavia. Look at who her parents are, what the education system is, and you'll probably figure out how she got to the person that she is. And this is all about who respects the seeds? Only those people who get their food from it and who have seen its purity and what it can do. Who respects the rivers? Those who can drink from it and who have back from it and know that it must be kept clean for others and animals and, 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 and those who come after them. But again, like I said, since many of us are disconnected with God's creation, we do not respect much, we are not grateful for much in our arrogance. Allah asked in the Quran, in one um, sort of anatomy, this verse, this sort is very beautiful, by the way, from the beginning all the way to the middle, it's talking about the different elements that are out there in, in, in nature, because it's named after the anatomy. Allah says um, in verse 17, then is he who creates like the one who does not create, 
And we, who do not create, we can't even really do anything for ourselves. We, as the supreme creator of the universe, that who creates, he who creates. And if you should come to favors, and this was mentioned earlier, you could not even do it. We're not even in charge for every single breath that we're taking right now. This oxygen that all of us are sharing in this room, imagine if we're in charge of this. So there's a whole world where we have to take every breath every day. Then Allah gives us an answer in another soul and says, Remember when the Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will certainly increase you in favor, but if you deny, indeed my punishment is severe. This is the story of Ibrahim. Last but not least, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah the Quran, and the servant of the most merciful, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Supreme Creator of the universe, the most merciful, are those of you who walk upon the earth easily, those who set off lightly. And when the ignorant address them, they say words of peace. So those are the enemies of peace, even in times of um, attack or something. Because it's part of the contract, the amount, the trust that Allah Subhanahu has given us, is part of what we need to do to sort of balance, to keep the balance in this land, and it's part of our DNA as vice parents, the Sida of Amigos on earth. Because the reason why we were created, Allah Subhanahu says, Allah has the Israel that you are doing, is to worship them. And worship, in its loose definition, or in its very um, uh, definition that I want to use here is doing what pleases Allah and what He has made permissible. So, everything that is good is worship. It's not just praying that it's worship. So, taking care of the body, taking care of each other um, is worship. The, 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 the spectrum of worship, actually, the spectrum of doing good is so vast that only a couple of things are mentioned that we shouldn't do. And that is very limited. But right now, again, in this day and age that we live in, the, we probably are a bit um, narrow vision in that we have left all of this vastness, the spectrum of good, and we're focusing only on this very minutiae of competition for material goods, competition for fame, competition for titles, and using resources that we don't really need, and probably denying. Uh, future generations, the resources that they will need. And again, that goes back to the question of do we say sustainability, the ability or sustain inability of tending the earth? Um, and basically, that's my comment. Thank you very much for listening. God created us in order to worship Him. The purpose of our, the first purpose of our creation is to worship God. Another purpose that God required us to do when he said in uh, another verse of the Holy Quran He created us from earth and he required from us to build it so the purpose of our creation is worshipping Allah the second is to build earth so these two purposes are very important and all our duties revolve, uh, revolve around them. If I go back to the Holy Quran, that scholar says, we have two books. God sent down one book, it's called the Holy Quran for, for us as Muslims, for us previous books. The scholars said the Holy Quran is the red book, the book that we read. But the universe is the open book. We learn from universe. Verses in the Holy Quran that invite us to look at the universe, to ponder, to, 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 to uh, meditate, to think, are more than the verse ask us to pray. So, invitation to look at skies, to look at earth. For that reason, some scholars said, pondering, meditating, the meditation of one hour is 
more useful or better than 1,000 hours in worship. Because through meditation, God created this thing and let, made us understand that everything on earth is worshiping Allah. Let's look at the creation of camels, the creation of mountains, the creation of everything on earth. We have to look at it. More than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that all of these things, they bow down to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything on earth. So Allah created this sort of relationship between us and the universe. So every Muslim has to have a peaceful and positive stance towards the universe. This environment that surrounds us is not something strange. We are linked. When God said we created you from earth, that means we are a member of this universe. We are not coming uh, uh, an alien uh, creation coming from outside. No, we are linked to the earth. So if we look at the Holy Quran, of course, brother has already mentioned the verse. Allah laid the blame on us because we as human beings, the corruption of earth, we are the one responsible for this corruption. And at the same time, we have, uh, we are invited, the Holy Quran invites us to correct the mischief we have done. So if we go to the, if we use the so-called, uh, the, the theory of uh, uh, environmentalism in Islam, it is really, really in the core of our belief, because we as Muslims, when we believe in the Holy Quran, we are required to follow the Holy Quran, and the Holy Quran invites us to be peaceful towards everything on earth, to, monitor, to, 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 to ponder, to, uh, to, to meditate, and to look at things in a different way. For that reason, every Muslim, he has to be peaceful because the universe is a Muslim, because it's following. Obey the, the, the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only human beings disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we follow the teaching of the Holy Quran, we are going to have a peaceful uh, position, a peaceful stance towards environments. So I am not going to repeat what they said about animals. Because the Holy Quran says clearly that animals bow down as everything on earth and worship Allah and they remember Allah and they glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we don't know the way they do it. So, but, as I told you, it is our duty to understand that the equilibrium on earth depends on our cohabitation and coexistence with the universe. Because we cannot think we are the only one who has the right to live on the universe and do whatever we want. So other features, other I mean, uh, species, they have their own rights. And the Holy Quran and the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him taught us that they are nations like us. Not only we as a human being as our nations, those us also are nations because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them and they are also nations. So this universe is, I mean, uh, uh, the, the protection of the, the universe is the responsibility of every one of us. A third point which is also very important, we have to, uh, I'm, you see now I'm, I'm jumping everything because I don't want to repeat what my colleague have already, already said. So. The, the, the responsibility of we as believers. The Holy Quran describes mankind as being vice-general. We, 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 we say nothing about that. But 
if we act in accordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, everything that we do, we have to think that we will be responsible about and Allah will ask us to, uh, to answer questions. For example, why we waste these things? Allah doesn't love wasters. This is enough to deter people to act in, in such way. The Prophet, peace be upon him, forbidden on us to hunt for sport or for uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, killing animals. No, we have to do it for a purpose. More than that, we are required, which is very important, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if the last moment, the last hours is going to come, if you are in the last moment on earth, the end of the world, and you have a plan, if you can plan it before the end of the world, do it. What does this mean? You have to be positive and you have to be productive at any moment, even if you are not the one who is going to benefit from it. So this should be a culture. This should be a way of life. You should not only grow things in order to have uh, the, the fruits or to have it. No, you have to do it as a way of life. You have to be positive towards everything because even at this last moment, you have to be good and to do something good. Because as brother said, everything on earth, if we plant or grow something, everything, every animals benefit from it. This will be written in the good deeds of, uh, in, the, in the scale of our good deeds. So from this perspective, the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, teach us to act in this way. So we have to be in cohabitation, in coexistence with the, with, with the environment. We have to look at it in a positive way. Because if we have this concept and we follow these steps, we will not have a problem. And unfortunately, the, the, the destruction of the ecosystem will not be as we are witnessing now. Last point which is, in my view, uh, Call on us because the purpose now is how to have the possibility to change our way of life, our method, the way we deal with environment. This should be from today. If we don't have this philosophy, we should have this philosophy because failing to follow the Quranic injunction, we have unfortunately, of course, upset the ecological balance, and we are going to pay the price for that. For that, even the Holy Quran, the verses of the Holy Quran said, وَهَرَدْ لَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِنَا كَسَبَتِ لِلنَّاسِ لِيُلِيدْ لَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا So, as uh, exchange or as, as, as a punishment of what they have done, what we are witnessing, the pollution, all these problems, this is indirectly a message to uh, tell us, be careful, because sometimes in order to uh, withdraw the attention of a person, he is doing something, he is not listening to you, sometimes you need to hit him, you need to do a little things in order to let him look at you. For that reason, I am saying that the Holy Quran telling us that we are, what we are witnessing today is the result the yield of our action. So we have to refrain from continuing doing that. For that reason, we are going to pay the price. So unfortunately, some people will not understand uh, the, the message peacefully. They need at least to uh, feel uh, sort of, uh, I mean, reaction, sort of feedback, sort of hit in order to understand and to raise their uh, consciousness about the, the importance of uh, uh, the, the, the matter. So, as a last point, as I told you, this is the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him says, whoever kills a sparrow 
or anything bigger than that without a just cause, God will hold him accountable on the day of judgment. What does this mean? This is a philosophy. A philosophy that we are not responsible only if we harm human beings. We are responsible in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we harm animals. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave us the story of a lady, and in fact two ladies. One has such cruelty that she confined a cat and she didn't uh, I mean, feed her until she died. He died. Then the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said she will go to hellfire because of this cruelty towards animal. People maybe will not understand this. Yes. And on the other side, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him told us the, the, the story of a prostitute from Ben Israel. She, I mean, found uh, a stray, an stray dog and she knew them because she, she came across the same situation. She, she was really, really, uh, she had a, a thirst and she couldn't, I mean, bear the, 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 the environment. So she realized that the dog has the same situation, is has the same problem. So she went down to the well and, and uh, gave him water. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, this prostitute was forgiven for what he, she did. So imagine that two person, one will go to paradise only because she did something good for an animal. And the other one will go to hell because she did something bad for an animal. So if we go from this, I mean, uh, perspective or proceed upon the, this method of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, we will be positive and we will have a peaceful stand, stance towards the uh, environment and towards everything because this is our duty as a human beings. So we are living in peace with uh, environment, with the whole universe, because we think we all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to act and to proceed upon what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said and what God said in the Holy Quran, if we are really the true believers. So from this point, I am coming to the conclusion that we, uh, if we respect and if we protect the environment, this is not only a way of life, but we are doing this in line with our belief, with our uh, with the teaching of uh, the Holy Quran and the, the, the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we are doing this in both, and we aspire and expect to get reward from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala by doing this. Give thanks to Allah for the moon and the stars Praise Him all day for what is and what was Take hold of your iman, don't give in to shaitan Oh you who believe, please give thanks to Allah